Hello everybody, Dr. Yu here again with the next video from the Calgary Guide video series, Diabetic Ketoacidosis. This is not something you want to see in an emergency room when you're a physician. So let's get started learning about the pathophysiology and the clinical signs and symptoms as they relate to the pathophysiology to help you be more comfortable when the situation comes up for you inevitably in the future. Please help us reach more viewers by liking the video just as it's starting out and by subscribing to my channel. So let's get started. Diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the complications of diabetes mellitus, most commonly type 1 diabetes mellitus. It's caused by infection or another metabolic demand, which increases the body's need for insulin. But since type 1 diabetes involves no insulin production, if no insulin is administered therapeutically, then that triggers the process of diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, these metabolic demands that contribute to DKA can include a number of causes, and you may have heard of them as the seven eyes mnemonic. They include infection, such as pneumonia, or appendicitis, or urinary tract infection, or sepsis, infarction, such as myocardial infarction, or a stroke, iatrogenic, which is a change in the insulin dose by the physician or by the patient, insulin, which is the patient not taking enough insulin or not taking any insulin, intoxication, such as with alcohol or illegal drugs, incision, such as surgery, which can also be a triggering cause of DKA, and initial. Kids oftentimes present in DKA as their presenting sign of type 1 diabetes. Now, because we have an absolute insulin deficit where no insulin is produced and no insulin is administered, that leads to two main effects. Effects because of the lack of insulin and effects because of the high blood sugar levels in the body. Let's talk about the lack of insulin first. Because there isn't any insulin in the body to suppress lipolysis, remember insulin is a anabolic hormone, not a catabolic hormone, that results in the body to start actually producing energy from triglycerides. After all, there's not enough insulin in the body for the body's cells to actually use the sugar in the blood. So the process of lipolysis begins with the release of free fatty acids from adipose tissue. The free fatty acids are then hydrolyzed in the liver in a process called ketogenesis. The acetyl-CoA is used as energy by the starving cell, and then the ketone bodies are what is produced that act as energy molecules for the rest of the body. These ketone bodies include chemicals such as beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. They're formed and they accumulate in the blood. Now why are they formed? Well, because of the way that neurons metabolize. Ketone bodies are the only other energy molecule, besides glucose, that neurons in the brain can use. So the body will produce ketone bodies as a source of energy for the brain whenever it perceives being low on glucose. These acidic ketone bodies will get filtered out by the kidneys into the urine, resulting in ketouria, which can actually be detected on a urine dip. Now because these ketone bodies are acidic, they also contribute to metabolic acidosis, a high anion gap acidification of the blood. It's a high anion gap acidosis because ketoacids consume serum bicarbonate. Remember that the anion gap is a mathematical construct calculated by subtracting the amount of bicarb and the amount of chloride from the amount of sodium in the body. Because ketoacids consume bicarb, that will increase the calculated anion gap for the patient. The increased acidification of the blood has a number of effects on the body. First, acidosis disrupts the enteric nervous system, which reduces gastric emptying, potentially even causing an ileus. That will cause abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, which in turn will worsen the dehydration that's part of diabetic ketoacidosis. We'll get into that in a minute. The body will reflexively compensate by trying to blow off carbon dioxide. Remember that carbon dioxide is acidic, and so breathing off more of it will offset the acidosis. That will result in a characteristic pattern of breathing for patients with diabetic ketoacidosis known as Kussmaul respiration, a deep and fast breathing pattern. As the patient is breathing, they'll be breathing off the ketones that is in their blood. And because ketones have a distinctive odor, which tends to be quite fruity in nature, they have this characteristic ketone breath. And finally, acidosis disrupts electrical signaling in the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. That will lead to weakness, confusion, and or coma in a serious DKA patient. Now let's talk about the effects that are caused by hyperglycemia. From the glucose that's remaining in the blood, and not being taken up by the muscle and fat cells because of the lack of insulin to stimulate the muscle and fat cells to take it up. The lack of glucose inside body cells, such as hypothalamic cells, causes the hypothalamic cells to sense the low intracellular glucose and trigger feelings of hunger in the body through complicated mechanisms. 
that will result in a sign known as polyphagia, a patient's desperate seeking out of food. Cells starved of glucose also triggers an increased release of catabolic hormones, hormones that break down complex molecules into simpler ones for the body to use. These hormones include glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol, and growth hormone. Collectively, they're known as the counter-regulatory hormones. The result of these hormones is that the body will try to increase blood glucose concentration to hopefully increase cell glucose absorption. Part of this involves reduced protein synthesis and increased proteolysis in the muscle in order to produce more substrates for gluconeogenesis in the liver. And in the liver, there's increased gluconeogenesis, the production of more glucose molecules, and increased glycogenolysis, the destruction of glycogen in order to produce more glucose. This paradoxically worsens the hyperglycemic state in the body. If the blood sugar level reaches over 12 millimoles per liter, more glucose is filtered out than can be reabsorbed by the entire tubules of the kidney, which will increase the urine glucose concentration to a detectable level known as glucosuria. Glucose in the urine filtrate also promotes osmotic diuresis. Remember that water will move down its osmotic gradient across any membrane. If the concentration of solutes is higher on one side, then water will move towards that side down its osmotic gradient. This is the case here. Water will move into the kidney tubules from the interstitial tissues of the kidney, resulting in large volume urine output, known as polyuria. And because the patient is peeing out large volumes of fluid without consuming equally large amounts of water, that results in severe dehydration. And patients can be dry up to four to five liters that will result in characteristic signs of dehydration, such as the reduced jugular venous pulse, JVP, signs of orthostatic hypotension, postural tachycardia, and increased resting heart rate. Remember that postural hypotension is a difference of over 20 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure when going from lying to standing after a minute. And postural tachycardia means an increase in heart rate of over 30 beats per minute when going from lying to standing after a minute. The dehydration will of course reduce the extracellular fluid volume which concentrates ketone bodies and exacerbates the acidosis that worsens all the clinical signs and symptoms of metabolic acidosis. The dehydration will also cause issues of its own. Lack of fluid reduces blood flow to the brain, spinal cord, and nerves, which will again worsen weakness, confusion, and leading to a possible coma. If the patient is alert and water is still accessible, the patient will respond by drinking heavily, not alcohol, water. And this sign is known as polydipsia. And finally, dehydration can of course alter the total body water and ion concentrations leading to electrolyte imbalance. One critical electrolyte in DKA management is potassium. In DKA, body potassium is lost via osmotic diuresis and vomiting. But the body compensates for this reduced serum potassium concentration because potassium will diffuse out of body cells into the blood. This results in a possibly falsely normal or even falsely elevated potassium concentration as measured in the serum. This is why treating DKA also involves giving IV potassium chloride along with the IV insulin as soon as the serum potassium reaches less than 5.0 millimoles per liter because of the goal to prevent hypokalemia. But of course, we need to treat the dehydration first. So to treat DKA, we first give plenty of fluids, IV. We then give insulin and or potassium. And then we follow the anion gap until it closes to know when to stop giving insulin. We then treat the underlying cause once the patient has been resuscitated. Finally, we treat the low phosphate levels, which typically occurs a few hours to a day after the ketosis resolves because of increased ATP production. And that's all for diabetic ketoacidosis. If you enjoyed our overview of this topic and now have a better understanding of just how and why the signs and symptoms of DKA are what they are, please give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. And if you're interested in more on the topic of diabetes, please check out my video on hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, as well as the other videos I have on type 2 and type 1 diabetes. Again, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.